Hey everybody, welcome to Microbiology. Uh, we are in the middle of a series on the basic architecture of prokaryotic cells, specifically bacteria. In the last video, we gave kind of an overview of the general bits and pieces that go into a bacterium. We talked a little about the cytoplasm um, and what's happening in the cytoplasm. We spent a, a bit more time on the genome, looking at the chromosome and these uh, extra chromosomal pieces of DNA that are called plasmids that are very common. What I want to do in the next couple of videos is talk about external structures that we find commonly in bacteria. Now understand that these are not required. Okay, sort of like plasmids, not every cell you look at is going to have a plasmid. Not every species will carry plasmids, although it's very common. Flagella, very common, especially uh, among motile, those that can swim bacteria. Um, but there are other motility mechanisms, and there are also non-motile bacteria that have no motility at all. But among the motility mechanisms, flagella is the most common. So we're going to look at flagella, and then we're going to talk about two very closely related structures called fimbriae and pili. All three of these are long protein polymers that are sort of like hairs. They almost look like fuzzy hair structures coming off the surface of uh, a bacterium and we want to look at these three and talk about how the terms are used and so that you know what we're talking about when we talk about flagella fimbriae or pili. So you've seen this image before in a previous video when we did an overview of the architecture but you may have noticed that where there are all these short hair like protein polymers uh, coming off the surface of the cell this particular slide is calling them pili. I'm going to distinguish for you between pili and fimbriae. I would have called these fimbriae, and honestly, I think most microbiologists, or at least bacteriologists, would refer to these, uh, where there are lots and lots of these short hair-like structures, as fimbriae. And we're going to put pili in a different category. In fact, we're going to associate the term pilus, singular, or pili, with F plasmids in the process of conjugation. So hold on to that thought. And then here we've got a single polar flagellum, very long, usually multiples of the length of the cell, uh, many times bigger than the cell, and usually far fewer in number than what we see with, with the fimbriae. So let's talk about these hair-like structures. Uh, fimbriae and pili are both plural terms. Fimbria is one, pilus is one. Short, relative to the cell length, relative to the flagellum. Straight, um, unlike the flagellum that is all over the map, and very thin appendages. They're composed of a protein called pilin, or a class of proteins called pilins, and they're used for different forms of attachment in bacteria. They're very common in gram negatives, and they're almost absent in the gram positives. Uh, if you're not comfortable yet with gram negative, gram positive terminology, we're going to be getting to it soon, but make sure that makes good sense to you because it's a um, really soon. Uh, it's a good uh, mental way of categorizing different types of bacteria, the gram negatives and the gram positives. So fimbriae and pili. Let's, let's look at some examples. So here's some fimbriae. Usually there are numerous fimbriae. Okay, lots of these short hair-like structures. Um, very especially common in the enterobacteria, which are E. coli and close relatives in that group of gram negatives. The family technically is called Enterobacteriaceae, but most people simply refer to them as the enterobacteria. That would be like E. coli, Klebsiella, Shigella, Yersinia, which causes plague, a variety of very closely related short gram negative rods. But you see that when it comes to fimbriae, there are lots of them. And they're relatively straight. And what are they used for? They're used for attachment. They could be used to attach to a surface to help form a biofilm. It could be an inanimate surface like a soil particle or a rock or something like that. Um, but in terms of infections, they are very commonly seen in attachment to tissue surfaces. Later in the semester, we're going to talk about this whole process of specific adhesion how uh, a pathogen of any kind needs to specifically adhere to the tissue that it knows how to. It's adapted to be able to infect. And very commonly, these fimbriae are involved in getting the bacteria directly to the, the tissue they can infect and kind of docking them, latching them onto that surface. Um, so here we go. Used primarily for attachment to host cells or other surfaces such as initiating biofilm formation and there are later videos on biofilms. Here's a picture of Salmonella typhimurium which is one of these enterobacteria and you can see lots of these little hair-like short structures called fimbriae uh, as opposed to these very long 
and far in few in between structures called flagella. And we'll talk about flagella in just a minute. And we'll differentiate the flagella from the fimbriae. But first, I want to differentiate fimbriae from pili. Now, here's reality. Okay, there, there is a technical difference, and I'm going to give you that technical difference. But reality is a lot of people mix and match those terms. A lot of textbooks mix and match the terms fimbriae and pili. So just recognize what they're talking about when it happens. Okay, now we're going to use the term pili or pilus, singular to talk about a sex pilus. Now a sex pilus is when a bacterium has an F plasmid, one of these conjugative fertility plasmids, and the plasmid itself actually codes for all the genes to make this pilus. And the role of the pilus is to reach out and extend itself like a hand or an arm, feeling around for another cell that does not have that same plasmid. Right? From the plasma's perspective, it's like an infectious agent that doesn't cause any harm usually. It just wants to spread. It wants to replicate. That's how it gets selected. That's why it persists. And so it feels around for a cell that doesn't already have one. It grabs on. And it used to be thought that the plasmid was transferred through the pilus, but we now know that instead what it does is it grabs the, the other bacterium, the recipient cell, and draws it near until the two of them are in contact. And then another set of proteins, also coded on the plasmid, the F plasmid, will open up a channel between the two. And then this really cool elaborate dance happens where a copy of the plasmid gets transferred from one cell over to the next. So you can see how it's metaphorically like sex. And that's where conjugation, the term comes in, conjugal and a sex pillus. So in our class, we're going to reserve the term pillus to refer to the sex pilus. So when we talk about a pilus, we're talking about conjugation and there's an F plasmid involved. If we want to talk about numerous hair-like structures that are being used for attachment, not to another bacterium necessarily, but to a surface like a tissue, we're going to use the term fimbriae. All right, finally, flagella. Flagella are whip-like tails, and we're going to see in a minute they have a motor that actually makes them rotate. And by rotating, it can, cut, it can propel them through the liquid phase. So you can see, and they're way too thin to see in the microscope without a stain, but these guys have been stained. And you can see here's a rod-shaped cell, a bacillus, and it's covered in these long, long flagella. Here's a, um, a, a, a helical cell or a... Um, a spiral shaped cell and there are clusters of flagella at either end as opposed to all along the length of them. They've been stained so that we can see them specifically. So what is a flagellum? These are helical polymers of a protein called flagellin that's basically just coiled to make this long, long, long strand that forms a long, thin appendage that's free at one end and attached to the cell at the other. And we're going to look at that little motor structure of attachment in just a minute and it can rotate fast enough to propel the cell forward at rates of up to 60 cell lengths per second. We call this swimming motility or flagellar motility. It's the most common way that bacteria can move if they can move at all. Remember we're talking optional equipment. Not all bacteria have have pili, not all have fimbriae, not all have flagella, but they're very common and so it's important for us to know about them. 60 cell lengths per second. I don't know if that sounds fast to you, but I looked up a cheetah. I think a cheetah runs at something like 25 body lengths per second, something like that. So hey, these bacteria swimming can be faster than a cheetah. How cool is that? Now, there are ways that we can describe bacteria based on their flagella that we'll get to in just a minute. I want to first show you how the filament, okay, the long filament that's extended out in the liquid phase, is attached to the bacterium. Now, for my class, I don't expect you to have all of this memorized. My upper division micro students have to. This is a lower division class. But I'd like you to spend some time in your textbook and on this slide getting comfortable with just an overview of the fact that there's a complex set of proteins and structures that lock the filament into the cell, we'll call it the cell envelope, the layers that make that outside surface of the cell. In a gram negative, the outermost layer is called the LPS membrane. The innermost layer is the cytoplasmic membrane. And there's a peptidoglycan wall in the middle. And you can see rings, and these are just made from proteins, rings that lock this whole structure, it's called a basal body, into the wall or the overall envelope of the cell. 
these uh, other two structures called moat proteins, moat short for motor, and fly proteins are involved in determining the direction that it rotates and in tapping into an energy source that we'll learn about later that allows them to actually rotate and power the rotation. In fact, when we talk later about uh, cellular respiration, cell respiration forms what's called a proton gradient. Uh, a, a high concentration of positively charged protons in this periplasmic space and a low concentration of them in the cytoplasm. They want to balance out. This is an electrical gradient or a voltage and they can actually flow through these moat proteins to balance back out again and as they move through they cause the whole structure to rotate. And so the energy of the proton gradient is used to drive and rotate the flagellum. I don't expect you to have all this memorized but skim it and have a basic understanding of it and I think you'll be um, you'll be in good shape for, for my class, for a lower division class. Okay, I mentioned just a second ago before I got distracted with, uh, the, uh, with the basal body of that flagellum that we can actually categorize bacteria based on the location and number of flagella that they have. So we use the term monotricious to talk about, or you can sometimes call it polar, to talk about a single flagellum coming out one end of the cell. Okay, relatively common. Uh, trich, T-R-I-C-H, means hair. So monotricious, there's a single hair being seen. It's coming out. Polar telling you it's coming from one end of the cell or another. Lophotricious, lopho refers to a cluster or a tuft, uh, has multiple flagella coming out of one pole. Amphitricious, amphi means both sides of something. You've got a cluster or tuft of flagella coming out both poles. And then peri means surrounding. So peritricious refers to flagella that are coming out of all sides, not just the poles, but even the, the lengthwide sides of a bacterium. So for example, E. coli and salmonella have peritricious flagella. Okay, so we can describe different bacteria. Another example of uh, polar monotricious, commonly pseudomonas bacteria are monotricious. Um, it's going to be helpful to begin learning some of that language that as you're reading, as you're studying, uh, you're not having to relook things up as you go along. Uh, why do they have, why bother having flagella? What benefit is there? Chemotaxis is the process of moving either towards or away from a chemical stimulant. That stimulant can be an attractant like a food source or a repellent like, I don't know, an antibiotic or a bacteriocin. So positive chemotaxis is when the bacteria will literally follow the gradient towards something that's beneficial to them, and their flagella are going to be key in getting them there. Negative chemotaxis causes them to run away from something that's dangerous or harmful to them, like an antibiotic. Chemo for chemical, taxis for movement, and it's the flagella that predominantly drive chemotaxis. Okay, what are some take-home points? Many bacteria have fimbriae for attachment, though not all. Many bacteria have pili for conjugation, not all. Many bacteria have flagella for motility, not all. And motility is driven by pre predominantly chemotaxis, this movement uh, towards or away from chemical attractants or repellents. Good luck with this information.